Hey guys, I'm Genuine Polish, and in this video, I'm going to be showing you how to customize the world size in Auction Not Included. So first, you're going to find your Steam folder, which generally is going to be on your main hard drive, whatever has your operating system. But if you change this location, then it'll be there. And you're going to click on Steam, Steam Apps, Common, Auction Not Included, Auction Not Included Data, and then Streaming Assets. I know it's weird that World Generation be in Streaming Assets, but it is. And then I'm going to be showing you how to do it for the DLC. The process is exactly the same for the base game, except for you won't click on this DLC folder, you'll click on this World Gen, and then follow the next steps from here. So go to DLC, Expansion 1, World Gen. And then from here, you're going to have to first identify the cluster you want to use. So this is important. You're going to want to decide in advance what cluster you want to use. Now, it's not horribly important, because if you'd like to, you can entirely customize this cluster. But if you don't want to go through and change every single planet, it because it takes a lot of time, then just pick which cluster you want. So sandstone start is the default starter. So we're going to open that one first. And so here is the, the information you need. The worlds that are located in your solar system. Now you can see here that I've actually added a fourth world. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit here. So first you're going to select your base world or whichever world you want to customize. If, if you don't want to customize all your worlds, just pick one out of the three or even pick one of the outer worlds if you want to have bigger outer worlds. So the first world in this cluster is worlds slash Terra Moonlit. So we're going to be looking for Terra Moonlit in the folder worlds. So we'll scroll down Terra Moonlit original delete. This is a, a copy that I've made and actually we're going to use this to demonstrate. So you're going to find the X which is the horizontal spacing of the horizontal tiles and then the Y, which is the vertical tiles. So it's really easy. All you're going to do is input a new value. So you could do 400 and 400. Now, what I've found is that anything over a thousand is probably going to break your game. Like it's, it probably won't even launch. Uh, I don't know if it has to do with how terrain gets generated or if it's just computing power of my computer, but anything over or close to a thousand is probably going to break your computer. So, and honestly, if you have a thousand wide planet, then that's 10 planets in one. So it might be a little bit overkill or it's five planets in one it might be a little bit overkill. And what I found also is that because duplicates have a better time moving left to right, it's, it's better to format it with maybe the Y being 70% or 75% of the X or even 50%. Because again, until you get plastic piping uh, or until you get tubes, like you're not going to be moving that fast vertically. So that would be my recommendation. Um, I've played on planets that are like 500 wide and 300 tall, and they work pretty fine. And so this is all the information you need to change the world size. And if we close out of this, of course, you're going to want to save. And then go back to the cluster sense and start cluster and what i would recommend is making a original file like you saw and then leaving it kind of separate just in case you screw up a whole bunch of things or maybe if you're just clicking around and you just put a couple of letters somewhere where they don't belong and it just completely destroys your cluster go ahead and just make a copy of even all of your world gen files just in case you mess something up so now we're going to be looking at the other worlds now there's important things to note especially if you're considering adding worlds to your solar system Ideal landing site, this is going to be for your second world that, or it's it's going to be for your world that doesn't have a warp pad. So it's important to, to, to notice what the worlds are in your world gen, because you don't want to put, you don't want to get rid of your ideal landing site. And that is also what the name will be called in the worlds folders. So when you're modifying it, you're going to look for ideal landing site, not just rocket world. And it's important to have an ideal landing site because the world's been generated to accommodate someone landing on the surface, right? It's not going to have no oxygen on the top layer for 500 blocks down if you do a huge, humongous world because it's it's already uh, generated. Like, it's going to generate a world that's more suitable to land on and, and have someone survive. And same with the warp world. You need warp world... You need the warp modification because it's going to give you the receiver and transmitter for the, the teleporter and also the material teleporter. And then so when you add new worlds, <laughs> here's the important thing. You want to follow the format exactly of everything besides the world. 
and what you want to use for the the world I found is generally rocket destinations or landing sites. I don't know why it just seems to generate best and have the most success, but really you could use any world in this category. You just want to do a, a, a test launch before you, a test launch where you go into sandbox mode and double check that the world's generated correctly before you actually launch a legit, legitimate game. So you're not wasting your time. And this buffer, I would recommend I don't know actually its function, so go ahead and just put two, two to four, honestly. And then what you want is, I think it's the spacing between individual objects. I'm not super sure. But what you want for the rings, this is the distance from the center, so it's going to be on the fourth ring out. And you, you have to think about that each planet has a one tile atmosphere surrounding it, a one tile orbit surrounding it. So if you have two planets, if you try to put planets one apart and there's no buffer and there the, the ring itself doesn't have enough space to put two planets one tile more than one tile apart then the game's going to break because you'll have two planets with the same orbit and the game just can't can't operate like that so for example with uh let's say you did ring two right that's the immediate ring around the planet outside of its orbit so Anywhere in that area, the, the second planet is going to be touching the first planet's orbit, and it's going to break the game. So I recommend doing it ring four, maybe even further, honestly, between ring three and four. And you can see that there's no rings here that are twos because it just doesn't work at all. And the, the start world is ring one. If you wanted to change the location of your start world, you really could by doing like some absurd thing, and then you'd be closer to your outer planets like if you did... Uh, minimum and maximum eight. So this is the, f the closest and furthest distance it can be. So all these are gonna be in the same ring. They're always gonna be in ring three, four, and five. But if you wanted to have like some variety, you could do, for your starting world, you could do zero, and then the max could be eight. So you could be on the other side of the solar system, and you could be surrounded by a bunch of outer planets, and you'd have to go find the inner cluster, which would be a fun game, I'm sure, but it's just something to consider. And so location type inner cluster, I don't know if this is an important distinction or if it's just something that helps, uh, you know, categorize the, the planets, but go ahead and include everything in the exact same format and then change the distance from the starting world and the world. And I'd recommend using the, the landing site. And then for outer worlds, it's the same exact thing. What you can do is you can actually use larger worlds out here. You just fill this up with larger worlds. You could f pull up a star map and figure out exactly how to place it to where every single tile was a planet. Whether or not your computer can handle that, I'm not sure. And you can see these ones do have variety in the, the distance they can be from your starting planet. And uh, what you can also do with these, if, if you're like, man, I really like the outer planets, but I wish they were big enough to build a colony on, you can go to worlds again, and you can find... Let's see which is like the mini reg. Uh, I, I don't know how to pronounce that. Mini regolith moonlit, and then again you can change the size. So you can see it's a it's a dwarf planet. It's a tiny planet, ninety six by ninety six. But again, you can change the size of it. And the way the game works is it, it's like oh every thirty tiles to the left and right there's going to be a new biome, and up and down there's going to be a new biome. So the world generation will actually fill up your world with pre, uh, pre generated terrains and like biomes and features and stuff and that's why i'd recommend not messing too much with features or biomes because the game's already got these formulas down to gen to populate your world in a way that works and functions and actually gives you enough supplies and so all you really need to do is change the world size to have a playable larger game so go ahead and change the name of the planet to something or the name of the planet cluster to something that you can identify i just chose custom and you can see that i have the original sandstone next to it but i chose custom here and it still lets you randomize the world gen so it feels like a normal game of oxygen not included it's just blown up in scale you can see here is the extra planet that i added and if you added any planet just to make sure that you were successful uh you can go ahead and scroll down here and just double check that they're there they should have a comprehensible name unless if you customize the name in the, the world folder you can see it's an irradiated Mars asteroid, and then it'll re-roll random traits, just like I, just like any other planet. And then in another episode, we'll go into adding uh, features 
such as like leaky oil fissures and uh, like custom geysers. But that'll be another episode because it's a little bit more in depth and I'd like to have a complete glossary of all the geysers and their names because some of the names are definitely have, some of the names of geysers are definitely uh, beta names in the files. Because I think for leaky oil fissure, it's like drip oil underscore fissure or something like that. And it's just not very intuitive. So you can't just guess and put it in the, the game. And the thing is too, the game won't crash if it has an incorrect geyser, it just won't generate it. So it's important to know, and I'll show you how to generate them in certain biomes. And then I just want to show you the scale of a 300 tile wide world, which really is not that big, or it doesn't seem like that it's that much bigger than a base world, but it just keeps going on and on and on. And uh, it's something that you can take into consideration because if your game already struggles, like if your computer's kind of older and it already struggles with the normal world at like cycle 100 then you're probably gonna have some issues if you just fill up this world with critters and duplicates so just be cautious of things that really you know demand computing power like critters liquid flowing heat transfer duplicates and machines so just be just be aware of that as you're expanding and um yeah it's pretty massive and then you can change this to all all your worlds and all the inner and outer clusters if you'd like it's uh it's up to you all right, thanks for watching.